Good morning and welcome to Indie Interactive, where we talk about making great music, connecting with your audience and growing your business. And yes, I see that FET is on the screen right now, howdy, and howdy. Not me, but that's okay. Um, I am, I think maybe in the corner or something. I am not in my studio this morning, so I am hanging out kind of incognito here because Fett's going to be our speaker today. So uh, um, in case you don't know me, my name is Bree Noble and I am the founder of Women of Substance Radio and Podcast on which page you are watching this. I'm also the founder of the Female Entrepreneur Musician and the Female Musician Academy. And I just want to welcome all of you guys this morning that are hanging out with us live. Just say hi in the chat. We'd love to know where you're from. Um, Fett is coming to us from Nashville. I'm from California. So let us know, you know, where you're coming from and, you know, what you're looking forward to hearing about today in this, um, this indie interactive that we're having today. And I want to say hi to Joan, to Dolores, to Deborah, and I'm sure there's more of you hopping on at the moment. So, um, let me just introduce Fett and hopefully you guys can all hear me. Um, like, again, I'm still dealing with these internet issues, so hopefully we're all good. I'll call him like a recording and mixing um, expert because he really is. He has years and years of experience doing this for other artists, teaching other people how to do it themselves. And he runs a well-known studio called um, Azalea Studios in Nashville. And he and his wife uh, run Azalea Music. And so he is coming to talk to you guys today about what you can learn to record for yourself, like in your home studio, as far as recording and mixing, but also how you can be knowledgeable when you're in the studio in being able to be a part of the production and mixing process. So Fett, why don't you take it away since I'm not even on screen and just let them know a little bit about you and, um, you know, you, you have a very special message for, for women working in the studio today and I, um, talking about, you know, how we need more women engineers and more women producers and women working in the studio. So I think this is very timely. So take it away. Well, it's, it's kind of been an interesting process. I mean, 20, 25 years ago, there was such a tiny percentage of women involved in the production side of the music industry that it was really, really an anomaly. And fortunately, for lots of different reasons, it's changing very, very rapidly over the last three to five years in particular. And I've noticed a lot of my students in my courses on music production have been increasingly, uh, the percentage is increasingly more women. Um, but it, it's more than that. I think people are finally starting to realize that men and women bring different sensibilities to the production process. And women literally hear differently. I mean, Scientifically, women have a higher uh, frequency range than men do in their hearing. They have uh, better hearing in terms of uh, the nuance that takes place in sounds and that kind of thing. So if you take a woman engineer producer uh, and a man engineer producer and you put them side by side to to listen to and to produce the exact same kind, uh, the same selection of music, they're going to get different results. And so there's a new phenomenon now that's coming where it isn't just women breaking the glass ceiling and getting into the roles that men traditionally play in the studio. It's actually women bringing a completely different sensibility and a different set of skills and a different set of uh, kind of hearing to the process. And that's what's been really appealing to me. I, I've worked with women a lot uh, over the last three and a half decades in the studio. Uh, I'm married to a chick singer, Nancy Moran, who's also my business partner. Uh, and it's, it's a whole different dynamic that takes place when men and women uh, are in the studio. And we need both. We need both kinds of energy to be there in order to get sort of a, a complete uh, total music experience. And that's the thing about it that really excites me the most. I love that. I love the idea that women actually bring a different kind of hearing to it. I actually hadn't thought of that, but yeah, I guess, I guess literally that is true. Just like when, you know, men and women sing, like there's a totally different, like overtone series that men bring versus yep. women. Oh, hmm, that's awesome. So what have you experienced now? Let me just say that he actually 
um, Fett actually started this special live clinic to teach women how to do um, production and mixing in the studio. And it's a, it's a live training that he did. And they did it for the first time in April. And I'd love to hear some of your experiences with that. And, you know, what, you know, what all the women like that happened and, you know, just like the camaraderie of getting excited about really grasping how to do all of this stuff that maybe at one point seemed really complicated and out of their realm. Well, you mentioned camaraderie, and this was one of the pleasant surprises. It was a suspicion I had before we started running these clinics uh, that fortunately came true in a big way. Um, I deliberately made it a women-only recording clinic because I didn't. I wanted to capitalize on that that female energy that we've been talking about, not just from a uh, you know a physiological viewpoint of hearing and what have you, but also the the cultural dynamic, if you will, of women working together as opposed to men and women working together. And what happened, what was fascinating to me was um, uh, within three hours of the first day of the four-day clinic, this sort of gel took place. And the, the group of people in the room, we had seven, uh, seven attendees at the, at the first clinic in April, but the, the group kind of came together as a unit. And they started to kind of work uh, cooperatively and collaboratively, collaboratively with each other rather than competitively. And it was, it was so fascinating to watch because we started out sort of introducing ourselves and everybody was a little shy and timid and didn't know each other. They came from all over the country. And we got into the initial lecture part of the studio and it took place in the big room, the drum room in the studio. And things were just sort of not uh, super familiar yet, for lack of a better way to put it. But again, within within three hours, the the dynamic that happened between the women in the room was was exactly what we'd hoped for. And it was you've got each individual there, but when you combine the individuals, you've got this group thing that's now bigger than the individuals. And for the next four days, everything was done as a team. And I think that's a, a, a skill, a, a quality, a characteristics that, that's very unique to women. Uh, men are taught be competitive, uh, kind of, you know, be your own, uh, you know, fight for your own turf and protect your own territory and this kind of thing. And women are kind of taught naturally, I think, uh, by our culture and because of their roles in society that collaboration is a lot more uh, productive and useful than competitiveness. And so that was a really fascinating thing. The other thing that took place was the technical confidence came out of the attendees in the clinic pretty quickly. And everybody who was there started to realize that they were way more capable uh, of not only doing the technical aspects of recording and mixing and mastering that we went over, but actually the production a uh, aspects, the more artistic, creative arrangement related stuff. And we, we kind of started this little, uh, this little motto at the second half of the first day, stand in your power. And the, the, the gist of that was that once you've got that confidence and you realize you can do it, then it's time to step forward and stay there. And that's what happened with everybody for four days. I was just blown away by the whole thing. It's exactly what I wanted, but I had no idea it was going to happen to that extreme. That just sounds so cool. And, and I know my friend, Michelle Lockie attended, and I was just so jealous of her. And especially hearing, you know, from you and Nancy, how everything went. I, and being somebody myself that has recorded, you know, in a studio and from home, like, I know there's so much I need to learn. I'd love to know from everybody that's here in the chat, like, what are the things about recording and mixing and production and stuff that really baffle you? Like, are there any subjects? I know that um, Michelle said that the thing that she just couldn't understand was, was compression. Uh, yes, and, the C word know, as we call yes, it. Yes, <laughs> and I think she finally, by the end of that you know, clinic of four days, really learned how to do compression and what it was and you know, could understand it inside and out. So if you guys you know for me, it's EQ, like I just never, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'd chat so maybe we can talk about them real quick 
Well, it's interesting. You mentioned Michelle uh, Lockie specifically, and uh, I want to say two things about uh, Michelle and the whole thing with compression and you mentioning EQ. Uh, Michelle is one of these great examples of somebody who, uh, because she's a film and TV composer and an artist and a, a performer, a songwriter, she was sort of forced into the situation of having to be a de facto default producer. And not only did she have to create the stuff and arrange it and produce it, but she had to do all the mechanics of the recording. And Michelle, like a lot of people, uh, has done it very, very well, but she's learned it totally seat of the pants. And this is this is sort of the other aspect of of being someone like Michelle. It, it all got kind of learned inside out. And the reason for that is back 20, 25 years ago and before, the way that people learned recording and mixing and mastering and all the other aspects of production was through a process called apprenticeship. You typically went to a commercial studio and you started out maybe sweeping the floors or if you were lucky enough, you might be a tape operator or something like that. And you, you watched over the shoulder of the engineers and you learned from them. And then one day the engineer got sick and you were suddenly in the chair and you became an assistant engineer and you worked your way up. But through that process, you learned all the fundamentals of audio and the physics of audio and this kind of stuff, as well as all the, the techniques. Well, all that's gone now. The plus side is we can all have a studio in our home and have access to really good quality gear and do the process ourselves without having to pay someone else for it. But the minus side of it is there's nobody there to apprentice in us anymore uh, or to be an apprentice with somebody else. And that's the partly the hole that we tried to fill with the clinic was I've been doing this for 35 years. I was lucky enough to get into the process when that old model was still there and learn from people and ask them questions. I remember um, uh, a mastering engineer here in Nashville, Randy Leroy, this is 20 some years ago when he first started mastering stuff for me, he'd been doing it a really long time. And he was kind enough to answer my questions when I was looking over his shoulder during a mastering session and didn't understand something. And so I got a lot of training that way, learning from other people in the industry who'd done it before. And, and that's the role the clinic uh, takes now we can we can break things down into the basic fundamental components like what is compression you don't have to learn everything about compression all at once right away but you do have to know three or four things that are really really fundamental to how compression works and most importantly why you use it and it's the same thing with eq everybody says well eq what's that and there's a million choices and there's lots of different ways you can do it. And I go on this video and they say to boost it at 3K and I go to this other video and they say to cut it at 3K. Which one's the right answer? And we break it down into the basic, basic pieces, the basic components of of what you do, why you do it. And then we actually show how to do it. And that you can get 35 years worth of apprenticeship, basically, in the space of four days. That was sort of a little tagline that I I. I motivated myself with in coming up with the content for the clinic. And that's exactly what happened to Michelle and the other women in the room. We got to break all that stuff down and build it right back up again. And we did it with a live band and a live production. So it was real world music. It wasn't just some canned thing that we had. Yeah. I think that's one of the coolest things is that you guys actually have a live band that you're producing in the studio while this is happening, which is so cool. Well, it's one of the things we're very fortunate about. We happen to be in Nashville and everybody knows it's Music City. But the, the one thing that's fascinating about working in this town is the studio world and the quality of the musicianship. And it's not just the quality of the playing or the musicality, but it's the quality of the work ethic and the skills that session players bring to the, the process. So when you're in a room with a drummer, who's been playing for somewhere between 20 and 40 years, depending on the person, and has this massive tool chest of knowledge and experience, both in the studio and with different styles of music. If you're paying attention as a producer or a person who does recording and you draw from that, two things happen. You get their skill and what they actually contribute to the recording at hand, but you learn to think like them. And a big, big part of being a DIY or self-produced musician or songwriter is having that mindset. I've got a bunch of tracks in front of me. I'm about to lay down a guitar part or a keyboard part. 
what would I do if I were a session musician? How would I fit in here? What parts would I play or where would I not play in this particular production as a session musician to really make sure that I fit in well and don't get in the way of the other parts? And when you've got four people in the room or five people in the room who've done this for decades, who are used to doing it in Nashville, you cannot put a price on that knowledge. And we specifically hire people for the clinic who get this. And we have two Q&A sessions on ba band day, as we call it, where it's nothing but sitting down with the musicians and picking their brains. So we're not recording at that point. We are talking to the musicians about how they approach a session, what they're thinking when they listen to the work version, what they do when they read down their Nashville number chart, which is something we teach about in the clinic. And then once we've done the, the session and everybody's played their parts and what have you, we've done the overdubs, then we have another Q&A session where we talk about the results and how we got there. Um, so that is a big, big part of it. And we're spoiled rotten to be able to get to do it in Nashville because the session musicians just don't get any better. That is really, really cool. I mean, seriously, I, I can't even imagine the experience of doing that. I mean, I know when I was in the studio, I loved every minute of it, but I didn't get to be around those amazing players. Um, let's see. Well, um, I'd like to add one more thing there yeah, Bri, ab ahead. about the session players, uh, because, it, you know, obviously I'm a guy and I'm teaching a clinic for women. So there, there's the first uh, sort of thing that needs to be explained. And and uh, I, I can go into detail on that. But with particular, uh, we hire male musicians uh, for the session players. And there are a lot of great uh, women session players in Nashville that I've worked with uh, over many years. But one of the things that we wanted to make sure with this clinic was all attendees who were invited to the clinic have to be women. Um, and they are in the shot calling roles. And that's part of the whole idea behind being a woman in the music production industry is you're not taking uh, instructions from a man who's the producer or the engineer. You are the woman who's the producer or engineer calling the shots. That's a big, big part of, of the dynamic uh, of the clinic. But at the same time, you're not going to necessarily be fortunate enough, and it's not necessarily what you want, to only work with women ever in the studio. So the, the sort of flip side of the women dynamic uh, being in charge is getting that cooperative uh, process going with both men and women in the studio, because that 99.99% .99 of the time is going to be the situation that most women are in. Even when they are in charge and they're calling the shots and they're making the decisions, they're most likely going to be working with men. So my goal with the clinic is let's have that whole female dynamic that I was talking about before kind of wear off on the guys rather than the other way around. And it also proves that there are men out there who are musicians and engineers and what have you who also get it. And they understand the dynamic and the benefit of having both genders working collaboratively together in the studio. So ironically enough, having men as the session players in the, in the clinic actually worked out really, really well uh, because they were getting their instructions from women engineers and producers and then had to deliver the results based on the language and the descriptions they were getting from them uh, in musical terms. And that, that worked really, really well. I, I was a little concerned at first that uh, members of the clinic would show up and they'd see, you know, on day two, they'd see some guys walk in the door to do the session. Uh, but it actually was the right decision and, and created a whole different dynamic during the process that I couldn't have gotten any other way. That's and really we, interesting. We, we wow. also chose the right guys to, uh, of course, to be in those yeah. roles, though. That, yeah, they I totally have a, get it. I have a comment about that. But first, I want to ask in the chat, you know, have you ladies experienced any kind of frustration or animosity in communicating in the studio? Have you felt like at all, you know, belittled or dismissed because of being a woman? I mean, I, I think there's plenty of people out there that are not that way in the studio, but I definitely have experienced it. And I'd love to know, um, you know, give me some hearts or give me some unhappy faces or, you know, just <laughs> let me know maybe like what, what kinds of frustrations in the studio you've experienced. But I did want to say, 
I'm, I'm glad that you're doing it this way because it puts the women in the driver's seat in they're kind of, you're kind of easing them into it. Like all the people, all the men that are your session players, they know what this is about. Right. Like they're not going to come in with a chip on their shoulder or anything because they know why they're there. But so it gives them kind of this middle ground to be speaking, you know, and leading men before there's any kind of maybe, you know, animosity that you might have to deal with from somebody that maybe doesn't want to take direction from a woman. And it's hard for me to believe that that's still true in 2017, but it is, it, it is true. Well, that's, uh, that's partly why we, we started this clinic. I, I'd like to tell my first story of, uh, of women uh, being dissed in the studio, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Go for and, it. And this is, I won't name any names or anything like that, but this literally happened this week, this past week. Uh, there uh, is a guy girl duo that we know who are very well established. They've been doing it a while. They're very experienced. Um, they both participate very actively in all aspects of their, the career of the duo. And they were shopping around for studios and there's this one particular studio in their town that uh, was recommended. And they went to the studio. And even though she was the one who made the phone calls and set up the appointment at the studio, the whole time they were there, the engineer producer who they met with said everything to him and not a word to her. He looked at the guy and spoke to the guy like she wasn't even in the freaking room. And talk about 2017. I mean, uh, I call it the car mechanic syndrome, right? You're a woman, you go to the, the car repair shop and they, they just look right through you. Or if your husband or your significant other who's male happens to be there, what do they do? They talk to the guy, right? And yeah. I, you know, that, that was one very, very current example. But I had seen enough of that myself that, you know, it was all right, enough is enough. First of all, it shouldn't be happening at all. But second, that's not how professional industry mu music industry people behave much less in any other industry and you mentioned the thing about the session musicians not having a chip on their shoulder and again this is a very uh great learning experience from nashville you learn very very quickly as a session player in nashville if you have any kind of an attitude whether it's a sexist attitude or an ego or uh, you're uncooperative or it's all about you and not about the song or any of that stuff, it gets out really, really quickly. And reputations are impossible, almost impossible to change, whether they're good or bad <laughs> reputations. So a well, true session player in Nashville. In your place too, you know, I mean, yeah, if, that's if, the if point. There's, that reputation, <laughs> there's a hundred gals or guys behind you who can do just as well. So it's uh, the the gender relationship part of, of a session and the whole production process is one aspect. But truly good music professionals know to not have any kind of an attitude at all because they're going to they're not going to get work, especially in Nashville. Mm. So we're lucky in that way that we're our, our session players and people who work in the studio uh, environment in general are predisposed to being very open very cooperative and really pay attention to who who's in the room with them and gender is you know not an issue at that point you're dealing with another music industry professional and that's all that matters so that's really really cool so, so it, it can happen and it does but it's uh, <laughs> we we need to spread that a little more absolutely so molly said and i remember her mentioning this to me before but she said that she was mansplained to badly mm -hmm. during her first experience in the studio and it took her years to get over it and like get the confidence to go back in the studio and be able to stand up for herself maybe you can explain i'm not even sure exactly what mansplaining uh, is. i have an idea of it but i know man, the, you know what that i means? know the term well uh, <laughs> let, let's let's see if she and i are on the same wavelength here the, the way i understand mansplaining is uh, a woman comes to a man with a something generally technical and or has a problem and uh, needs it to be addressed. And the typical mansplaining way to do it is to uh, use a lot of uh, words or acronyms, TLAs, we call them three letter acronyms, <laughs> and not really explain, but just sort of uh, describe it in such a way that makes the person asking, in this case, a woman specifically, 
feel even smaller than they did before they asked the question in the first place. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying, well, why did, you know, what, what happened there when you changed the compressor instead of saying, well, you know, I changed the zippy tang brang belch fire eight parameter from (laughs) 0.5 to (laughs) 0.75. And that's what made the Florgelmeister become a Franistan. What you say is I wanted to get a little bit more volume out of the vocal without making too much a negative impact on on the music. So I took the threshold control on the computer and brought it uh, on the compressor and brought it down instead of just raising the input level. Th- that's just kind of an arbitrary example. But uh, ma- mansplaining means not really explaining at all. And sort of staying in this position of, oh, I'm the one with the technical knowledge because those are guy tasks and making the woman asking the question feel that much smaller. And no mansplaining allowed. (laughs) No (laughs) mansplaining allowed in this one, for sure. Right. At the Empowering Women in Audio Clinic, uh, it is about empowering women. And this is the cool thing, uh, getting back to that dynamic that we talked about before. What I loved about that that gel that took place pretty much right away was the first half of day one, somebody might ask me a question about microphones or compression or something like that, and I would explain it as the teacher to the group. Well, by the afternoon of the first day and for the rest of the clinic, somebody would ask a question and one of the other women in the group would answer it for them. And mm. the, the students in the clinic learned so much from each other. And well, and I, this is not a negative thing at all about myself, but the more the clinic went on, the more I became a facilitator rather than an instructor. And that's exactly what I wanted. And, and what was cool, at, even after the clinic, uh, the women who had attended the clinic are now collaborating online with music productions. Mm. Uh, so two of the women got together after the clinic and uh, wrote and produced a song over the Internet with each other that one of them performed uh, for a women's breast cancer event. I mean, this is exactly what we want. So the great thing about that stuff is it all took place organically. It wasn't something that had to be forced on anyone. And it, it was I think it was that natural female energy coming to the surface when it was given the chance to do so. Mm, that is that is so powerful for sure and i love i mean in any great connections and if you're all in the music industry i think it can only lead to greater things in the future amen amen so i just wanted to ask like one more question about you know why why you're doing this with specifically women as far as do you find that in and I know I find this because that's why I have the Academy so I can have just women, but do you find that sometimes in mixed company, it's harder for women because, you know, they don't maybe don't want to look like they don't know what they're talking about. Or again, they don't want someone to like mansplain on them. Um, you know, it, is it just creating that safe environment? Yeah. And, and safety is the word. Uh, I, I think it's, it's two things. You have to feel safe in order to be yourself. Uh, but the other thing uh, is cultural. And I'm making generalizations here. I realize that. But but you'll understand where I'm going with this. Uh, our culture uh, tends to teach women to be submissive. Uh, so I am not going to step forward as a woman and uh, ask a question or or more importantly, heaven forbid, press my opinion about something when culturally I've told, well, that's being pushy or that's being bitchy or whatever term might happen. So my natural tendency is going to be to sit back, uh, not necessarily do what I'm told, but, but defer. That's the word I'm looking for. Defer to the people in charge or the people in power rather than exerting myself. So part of creating a safe environment and getting just women together in, in the studio is to just eliminate that veneer. It's not there anymore. And again, that's one of the reasons I love to play the facilitator role is I don't need to teach self-confidence. I don't need to teach assertiveness. All that is already there. All I need to do is create an environment where that self-confidence and that assertiveness can come through. And that's exactly what happens in the clinic and, and why we don't have a mixed company instruction environment. Uh, women have to have that that uh, that space in which it's okay 
to be a human being and do the things that human beings do without having to worry constantly about, all right, from a cultural viewpoint, where do I fit in versus the men in the room? We just eliminate that from the equation altogether. And it's very, very powerful. Yeah, it's funny. I'm pretty assertive in mixed company, but in the back of my mind, am I overstepping? Are people going to think that I'm being too brash, you know? And yep. why is that? Like, you know, I have good questions, like, you know, and it doesn't stop me, but still I feel like it's in the back of my mind. And I think it does stop a lot more people that maybe don't have, you know, the experience or, you know, like I do, or just have this, like, whatever I have that I don't care, but I, I don't care, but I still think about it. So I, I love that there's that opportunity. And that's what I do in the academy too. You know, I always want to have a mm-hmm. safe place where everybody, it's okay to ask whatever they want to ask. Look, you know, if you don't want to put on makeup that day, that's cool. And you don't have of that environment that you're creating there. So well, I, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Nope, go for it. I was I was going to follow up. That there's there's two elements to this whole uh, dichotomy between men and women's behavior. Not only are women taught to be uh, submissive and and defer, but they're also given uh, completely contradicting messages. And the, and the, the the contradicting message is, in order to get ahead in our society, in our culture, and in order to achieve and become great at what you do. You have to be assertive and you have to step forward and you have to push your opinions because that's what men are taught to do. Right. So Hmm. not only are you taught to be one way, but you're taught that the right way is not that way. So so if you're a woman and you're in the studio and you've got some, you know, and I'm not dissing guys. I mean, I'm a guy. But if you've got a bunch of guys there and they're all kind of, you know, uh, fired up and and being all macho and everything else, you're just kind of get get pushed back in the corner and not have a chance to participate on an equal basis with the other people in the room. And what, what's interesting about this uh, though, and, and another reason I, I said I'm not dissing guys is most of what we're talking about, especially in the music industry and in the production environment, which I'm most familiar with is completely unconscious. Mm-hmm. Like that guy, you know, who deserves a slap upside the head, but, be that as it may, who was only talking to the guy in the room uh, and ignoring the woman completely uh, when they went in to check out the studio, literally might not have even been aware that he was doing it. Now, I don't know who taught him to behave that way, but my point is that part of the way we break through this this odd dichotomy in our culture is to make it uh, make people aware of it. Um, A lot of times people make cultural faux pas, if you will, uh, based on, you know, race, religion, whatever it may be. And they're a little bit easier to recognize. And they're a little bit, we're a little clearer as a society, maybe on where the boundaries are. But when it comes to this gender thing, 90% of the people I think who are the offenders, if you will, are just walking around clueless. No one's ever called them out on it. Nobody said, you know, that's probably not an appropriate way to behave. And not only that, but here's another way to behave that will get you better results. So when it comes to men and women, if you engage a woman in the studio and you ask her her opinion, she's going to bring all of her experience and all of her uh, life perspective and everything else to that discussion. Two heads are way better than one. So if you if you won't be quite so dominating and, you know, pushing your opinion down people's throats because you've taught to been taught to do that, you're actually going to get more of what you want than uh, than you ask for. So uh, it, it's not it's not that, you know, uh, our culture teaches guys to be jerks and they're all jerks and they're going to stay that way. It's more guys need to be made aware not only that how their behavior looks, but there's this whole other dimension that women bring to the process uh, that we need to allow to happen because the results are better. And, you know, my whole motivation, uh, and this is, a you know, the, mo- the motto in Nashville is uh, it's all about the song. Well, when I'm in the studio, it's all about getting the best results from the production. And if there's a woman in the room who's got a better idea than I do, or has a completely different idea that because of my own 
personal background would never think of. I want to hear that opinion. Uh, we want to try that thing out and find out that may be the magic sauce on this particular song. Uh, so in my profession in particular, uh, this is really, really critical to music production to make it work right. Mm. This is this is all so good. And and we're people in the chat. because we haven't just gotten into music related stuff, but obviously, you know, women and men and the balance of conversation and, you know, learned behaviors and all that, which is so great. Um, but I do want to turn it back to the clinic and I'd love to have you, you know, give them an invitation to join in the clinic. It's coming up and we have a very special deal for you guys, my audience. So why don't you let them know how they can get involved, like exactly what's involved in the clinic, how many days, what you're doing, and how they can go jump into it. By all means. Uh, it's a four-day clinic. Uh, again, it takes place here uh, at Azalea Studios, actually right here in Nashville. Um, and it's uh, July. Th this particular clinic is July 27th through 30th. So it's four full days. And I do mean full days, like 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., four days in a row. Um, and what we do on day one is we do uh, pre-production. Uh, we do charting and we do setup. So we listen to the song. And uh, what we do is we take a single song uh, through the course of the clinic from start to finish. So we start with just a, a work version of a song. Uh, and what we need to do then is break down the components of the song, talk about the arrangement, uh, do the Nashville number system chart, which is a very, very powerful system, uh, particularly for recording uh, studios. Uh, so we, we do a crash course in that, and we actually use the Nashville number system to do the chart. And we talk about instrumentation and, and what uh, what parts we're going to have and, and what have you. We talk about the key, the tempo, all the other aspects of the song uh, to be ready for the session. And then we get pretty much right away heavily into uh, a discussion about microphones, uh, their features, uh, microphone placement, uh, and then how we mic up the various aspects of the particular uh, production we're doing. So the drum kit, the electric guitar amp, uh, the acoustic guitar, the keyboard, uh, the vocals, that kind of thing. And we set all that stuff up for the following uh, day's session. So day two, uh, because we've done all this preparation and setup, is the session itself live with, with the band. So the band comes in in the morning, and we do a very, very typical Nashville-style 10 a.m. session. Uh, all, the, all the sessions in Nashville are at 10, 2, and 6. Uh, so at 10 a.m. is downbeat, which means that we're recording the song at that point. We go through the, the different iterations after we've had the, uh, the Q&A with the band. Uh, and we actually finish all of the tracks, including the overdubbing, uh, on that day. And then we have another discussion with the band. And then we have uh, a discussion about what happened so people can ask questions uh, about what certain things were done and and what we do during the session and the reason it takes uh, the better part of a day to record a single song is we have what I like to call teaching moments where we'll be in the middle of something and we'll stop and say uh, why did that just happen and what what is feeling off here and get the the attendees the, the students in the room to participate and make a suggestion like maybe the keyboard's playing in too high a register and it's kind of arguing with the guitar. So why don't we have one of them switch where they are or play a different pattern uh, to make the, the thing lock in better, that kind of thing. So that that's uh, pretty much all of day two. And uh, as I mentioned before, it's like getting years and years and years of experience in Nashville sessions all compacted in, into one day. Uh, day three is all about mixing. Uh, so we start with the tracks that we recorded the day before, we break it down, and then we go through uh, the five primary mixing tools, which are a level, a compression, EQ, uh, panning, uh, and what am I forgetting here? That was four, wasn't it? <laughs> That's funny. Anyway, we go through all of the uh, the aspects of uh, the tools. Oh, uh, effects. That was a time-based effects was number five. So we go through those five aspects of mixing and how they are sort of the starting point of how to approach a mix. And then we actually build the mix literally from the ground up. So we start with the very, very uh, basic uh, first track or tracks, and we add tracks along the way. 
We talk about how we would use those five tools with each track. And then we talk a little bit about a concept that I'm very uh, uh, enamored with, which is a layering and a thickening of instruments and that kind of thing. So that's all of day three. Uh, and by the end of day three, we've got a finished mix uh, and people can uh, get involved in the mix. And again, make decisions, uh, say, well, you know, it's it's great that um, we've got the uh, the organ part doing what it's doing there. But when we get to the bridge of the song, the organ is too loud or too bright or whatever. So why don't we use some automation to change the organ part so that when we come back into the, the last chorus and out that the energy returns to the production. So we're not only talking about the production and how to mix, but we're also, you know, using those mix techniques hands on as we go. Whew, but we're not done yet. Day four is all about mastering and wrap up. Uh, so the first half of day four, we actually master the song uh, that we have recorded, overdubbed and mixed over the previous two days. And mastering is one of those things, if, if I had to pick uh, one or two, uh, it would definitely be in my top two of things that DIY uh, home recordists uh, could use a lot of experience with. But oh, it's absolutely. Also I see so many people mastering and I get so many tracks sent to me that are not mastered and I can totally tell. Well, it's one of those things, you know, mastering, you've got to see it to get it. It's not just... You know, somebody plays you a mix that's not mastered and then somebody plays you a mastered mix and goes, there's the difference. You uh, talk about mansplaining. Mm. You've actually got to see it and you've got to understand. I'm all about mindset, process and psychology behind things. And you've got to have somebody actually do a mastering session you with you participating and explain why in the world we master in the first place. And then, well, how do we master? How is mastering different from mixing? Uh, so we spend a, several hours uh, on on the, the beginning of day four mastering the song we've just mixed. And you can literally hear the before and after when we're done to understand, OK, not only that's why we master, but this is how we get there. Mm -hmm. And then we reserve time at the end of day four for any kind of wrap up, uh, more Q&A, um, uh, what we what we do. Uh, the last time we recorded one of uh, actually Nancy's songs, Nancy Moran's songs, she was the artist because she's got a lot of experience in the studio and what have you. So she participated a lot in day four in explaining her perspective on the whole thing. So she wasn't one of the students in the clinic. She was actually the artist. So uh, when she was in there cutting the vocals, there was a certain thought process, a mindset that she was going through and, and she had to learn to interact with the band and the engineers, plural in this case, uh, to make the process work smoothly. So there's a lot of discussion uh, with Nancy on that day four about the artist's perspective and the performer's perspective uh, on the process. So it's a very full, very immersive, very comprehensive, intense four days. And although we all did a lot of work uh, over the four days of the last clinic, we were so pumped. <laughs> uh, we, we just couldn't stop on day four. So we all went out for sushi afterwards. It wasn't like anybody was, you know, wanted to go home and crawl up and be by themselves. We, we just we had such a dynamic going. that we, we kept it going at the sushi place for several more hours after that. So that's a very quick overview. Obviously, there's lots more detail than that, but that's that's how the clinic works. That is so awesome. So I do want to say that Sarah Baker, which I'm assuming you know, oh, says yeah. Fett's clinic is absolutely awesome. I cannot say enough good things about it. Highly recommend it. So we've got somebody who's been to the clinic besides, uh, obviously, my friend Michelle Lockie, who also absolutely loved it. So um, I think there's a million reasons why you should go to this clinic, especially if you're especially if you're doing things like licensing or you're just wanting to do more recording from home, you could just grasp so much in these four days. And, yeah, you know, and I wish I'd had this instead of trying to figure it all out from a book. <laughs> well, that's partly why we came up with it. I mean, you know, there are a lot of recording clinics out there. This is not the only one, but this is the only recording clinic that does everything from the perspective of a woman. Yep. And it's a completely different angle. But what's cool about that is that's sort of, if you will, the catalyst you know, sort of the juice to get things going. But while we're doing that, we are talking about hard engineering and production skills. And, mm -hmm. you know, you, you use Sarah Baker as an example. 
she was one of those people who came to the clinic and Sarah's got a lot of experience. She's got a really uh, good setup at home, but she went home with the renewed sense of, damn, I've actually got something here already. I've, I've got good uh, quality uh, set up and I do already know some things. And now I can bring all these additional skills to the process and go forward, not only doing my own stuff, but now when I'm communicating with another studio who's cutting my vocals or whatever the process is, not only do I know the terminology, I understand what they're doing. So I can now kind of step into my role and say, you know what, I, I really think that the vocals uh, are too bright with that microphone or whatever the example may be, because I've now done it myself. Um, mm. And everybody goes away with this sort of uh, bag of tricks, arsenal of tools, whatever, that they don't go away. Uh, we have a lot of handouts uh, through the clinic, little sheets that I like to hand out on all the various things so that you don't have to take it all in. I encourage people to record uh, the, the lectures and the, the sessions themselves as we're going. So they have something to refer to uh, when they go home. Um, but it really does pack uh, a lot of experience and hard skill into a very, very uh, short time frame. So if, if you're, if you're a woman who would not like to have to go to, you know, uh, recording school for 18 months uh, or, or if you have and, realize you might not have as much uh, real world uh, knowledge that, that you were expecting uh, than you than you got. Uh, this is the way to do it. And I, I was really spoiled by the, the seven women who attended the first time around. But it, the, the dynamic was just amazing. But it told me that's where the bar is already. I already know that there are women out there with this attitude, this level of skill, this level of capability that are already participating uh, in the in the production world. And I was really encouraged by it. So let's make more of those, please. <laughs> yeah, and let me just say, this is a very limited clinic, obviously, because it's so hands-on. So they are only offering it to seven to 10 women. Right. So if you guys wanna do this, I would jump on it ASAP because we're getting really close. Um, I cannot wait to hear your guys' stories from coming back from this clinic. So I also want to let you know that there is a promo code that FET has generously given to me to use for my audience only. And it gives you the biggest discount that they've offered, which was their early bird, which is no longer available for quite a while. And that promo code is B-R-E-E-Z-Y 997. And I'm going to throw it here into the, into the chat. So you guys have it to the clinic what's the website uh the website is empowering women in audio.com empowering women in audio all strung together.com mm -hmm. and when they go to the the link at the bottom to sign up uh when they get to the form they can type in that breezy 997 code uh and get basically the best price that is available on the planet right now it's the only way to get it Awesome. That link is, yep, it's showing up. And so I cannot wait to hear. Actually, what I'd love to do is if any of you guys do go to this clinic, I want you to let me know. And after you get back, I'd love to do an interview or a podcast or a Facebook live with you to find out everything you learned and, you know, what, why you loved it and what you came out of it. Let me know on here and you do attend the clinic i hope many of you do as do i and and to your point before we do like to keep it to keep it really small and intimate so we we really try to cut it off at 10 people if we can so there's there's a few seats um but uh you gotta act fast basically perfect well thank you so much for coming on with me today fat and you know being so um giving of your knowledge and explaining and not mansplaining <laughs> <laughs> everything about um audio and just giving us a sense of what they will get if they go to this clinic i appreciate you giving of your time to the women today right back at you brie thanks a million you are welcome and thank you guys so much for hanging out with us on indie interactive and I look forward to seeing you next time. And of course, if you want to go back and watch any of this and get more information and jump into the link and 
and join this clinic that's coming up super fast. You can always come back here to this. This will be up on our page for several days. So I look forward to hearing about all your success stories at the clinic. Thanks much.